turn. Now today we're in Psalm 79. We're going to be looking at Psalms 79 through 81 as we continue our, our study through the book of Psalms. So let's begin reading together in Psalm 79, and, and I'll read the psalm to you, and we'll get into our study this, uh, this evening. Psalm 79, beginning at verse 1. This is a psalm of Asaph. Asaph, the psalmist, writes, O God, the nations have come into your inheritance, your holy temple they have defiled. They have laid Jerusalem in heaps. The dead bodies of your servants they have given as food to the birds of the heavens, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. Their blood they have shed like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to those who are around us. How long, O oh Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you, and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of your name, and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, Where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight the avenging of the blood of your servants which has been shed. Let the groaning of the prisoner come before you according to the greatness of your power. Preserve those who are appointed to die, and return to our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach what they have reproached you, O God. So we, your people and sheep of your pasture, will give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations. Now again, as I mentioned as we begin this psalm, this is a psalm of Asaph. And basically, as you see, as we read through this psalm, it's a psalm and a cry really for God to deliver the nation from her enemies. And it's also a cry to God uh, to avenge Israel uh, for all that she has been suffering during captivity. You see, Israel has been taken, when this psalm is written, Israel has been taken into Babylonian captivity. God had allowed the nation of Israel to be taken into, into captivity because she had forsaken her God. Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 39, verses 6 and 7 said this. He said, Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And so Isaiah had prophesied that, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, actually fulfilled that prophecy. We know through history that he actually mounted three attacks on the nation. In 605, 597, and 586 B.C., Babylon, through successive invasions, actually destroyed the nation of Israel. Israel was laid waste. And as, uh, as we were just reading a minute ago where he says in verse 1, Your holy temple they have defiled. Israel was laid waste and the temple was ransacked and the temple was destroyed. In 2 Kings, in chapter 25, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says all the army of the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city and the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. So they went into, into, into captivity there in Babylon. Now, I want to read to you, if you take notes, it's found in Lamentations, in uh, Lamentations chapter 1. I'm going to read to you a little bit about a uh, description of what was taking place because even as we're reading here, um, we read, that the psalmist says, uh, your holy temple they've defiled, they have laid Jerusalem in heaps, the dead bodies of your servants they've given as food for the birds of the heavens. He says, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth, their blood they have shed like water all around Jerusalem. There was no one to bury them. We become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to those who are around us. In Lamentations, in chapter 1, this is a picture of what took place. Listen to what uh, Jeremiah the prophet writes. Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. And he says this in chapter 1, verse 1, How lonely sits the city that was full of people, how like a widow is she, who was great among the nations. The princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks among all her lovers. She has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into captivity under affliction and hard servitude. 
She dwells among the nations. She finds no rest, and her persecutors overtake her in dire straits. The roads to Zion mourn, because no one comes to the set feasts. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted. She's in bitterness. Her adversaries have become the master. Her enemies prosper, for the Lord has afflicted her. Because of the multitude of her transgressions, her children have gone into captivity before the enemy. He says in verse 10 of the same chapter, the adversary has spread his hand over all her pleasant things. She has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you commanded not to enter your congregation. In verse 18, he went on to say, the Lord is righteous, for I rebelled against his commandment. Hear now, O peoples, behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men have gone into captivity. And in verse 21, they have heard that I sigh with no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. Bring on that on the day that you have announced that they may become like me. And so Asaph here is, is speaking concerning the fact that the nation has gone into captivity in Babylon. Notice in verses 2 through 4 how it speaks of the dead bodies being given as food for the birds of the heavens. In other words, the destruction was complete and it was brutal. As a matter of fact, dead bodies are being left in the open to be um, food for the birds of prey. See, the relatives of these people fled trying to save themselves, or they were exiled, and because they weren't there present to bury them, their bodies were left out there to rot. Jeremiah 7.33 says, The corpses of this people will be food for the birds of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. No one will be able to frighten them away. And so that's what's taking place here as Asaph is writing. And so the question, verse 5, How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have destroyed Jacob. Jacob is another name for Israel. They have destroyed Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. It seems like this is going on forever is what he's saying. God, your zeal feels to us like fire. And we request something from you. We request that you destroy your enemies. And we request that you deliver us from them. So he's asking how long. Because sometimes it seems like, like it's, it's forever. And that's the question. Or actually the statement and the question. How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Because it seems like God continues to pour out his wrath on them without any letting up. Verse 8. Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us. For we have been brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of your name and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight the avenging of the blood of your servants which has been shed. So he's asking him, do not remember our sins. Now, we know as New Testament believers that that request is actually answered in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that in the Lord Jesus Christ, that when Jesus died on the cross for us, and when His blood was poured out on our behalf, that as His blood was shed, it was shed for the remission of our sins. And it's like a fountain, if you will, that pours out to, to cleanse us. In the Old Testament book of Zechariah, in Zechariah 13.1, it says, in that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, as he shed his blood for our sins, it's like a fountain that has been poured out. His blood is sufficient for that. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in Jesus we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And so when he says in verse 8, do not remember the former iniquities against us, let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, that is actually fulfilled in the New Testament when Jesus Christ comes and actually uh, gives his life for us, pours his blood out for us, and as we trust in him, we actually receive forgiveness of our sins. In verse 11, let the groaning of the prisoner come before you. According to the greatness of your power, preserve those who are appointed to die and return to our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom, their reproach, which they have reproached you, O Lord. So we, your people and sheep of your pasture, will give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations. 
And so I want you to notice that in verse 11 how he says, let the groaning of the prisoner come before you. This reminds us of something you find in another Old Testament book, in the Old Testament book of Exodus. Because when the children of Israel, as it's recorded there in the book of Exodus, were in bondage there in the nation of Egypt, they had been there for 430 years. When the nation of Israel was there, they were groaning under bondage. The Bible tells us in Exodus 2.23, it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. Their cry came up to God because of the bondage. And so bondage, the groaning of the prisoner is bondage, is representing the bondage that they're in. One is they're in physical bondage, but two, we can, we can see a spiritual reality to that because when a person is in bondage to sin, they also groan. Because anybody who's involved in sin knows that they have become a slave. And a person who is a slave to that sin actually can begin to groan out for deliverance. And they can cry and say, God, we need you. And so what we're asking you to do is deliver us, but we're also asking you to avenge us on those who have harmed us. That's what he means in verse 12 when it says, return to our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom. The number seven in, in the Bible speaks of perfection, and so he's saying, I want you to completely avenge us. And as you do, as you work on our behalf, as you deliver us, as we begin to understand that we have our sins forgiven through confession and turning to you, then we're going to show forth your praise, not just amongst ourselves, but we're going to show forth your praise to ensuing generations. And once again, I'll say this briefly because uh, we need to move into Psalm 80, but once again, one of the things that I encourage every one of us in this room to, to really take to heart tonight and to live this out is the reality of the fact that we have been called by God not to be saved just by ourselves, but we need to remember that we were saved to be part of a community, that we are part of the body of Christ. And so we have community life. And beyond that, we have been called by God, instructed by God in the New Testament to take this good news, this gospel message that talks about our sins being forgiven and us having a right relationship with God and our, our names being written in the Lamb's Book of Life and, and heaven being our home and we're just journeying through this life right now, we've been called by God to take that message and to give it to other people. See, when I first got saved, when I was a brand new Christian, I got saved at, at the age of 20 and all. When I first got saved, I went into the back room there. There were 4,000 or so people seated on the ground. I was one of the 10 or so that stood up that day to give my heart to Christ, at least at the second invitation. As I stood up there and, and, I, and I prayed with that evangelist to open my heart to the Lord, I went into the back. And they took us into the back room so they could share with us a little bit. And there was a young man who was sharing with me. And he began to share with me some very basic things about what it means to be a believer or a Christian. And as he was sharing with me, he said there were some things that I needed to do. One, I was supposed to start reading the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, God is speaking to you and he's communicating his mind to you. And that's how he's going to direct your footsteps. And two, as I was reading the Word of God, I was to learn to pray. Not only was I to learn to read the Word of God and pray, but also I was to fellowship with other people, people who love the Lord. And so he said, what you need to do is you need to start going to Bible studies, and you need to have relationships with, with, with your with, uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord and all. It's called fellowship. And then he said, and this is what God is doing in your life today. You should be sharing that with other people. And so one of the things about the Jesus movement that sometimes we forget, and I want to remind us and rekindle in this church, is, is the fact that the Jesus movement is an evangelistic movement. I have never been, as a new Christian, growing up, I had to learn a whole lot, and I, I wasn't, you know, a mature person. For many years, I didn't mature in the things of the Lord. But as a new believer, I was trained to do this. I was trained, and I believed it, embraced it, and have practiced that throughout my walk with the Lord. I was told you need to communicate your faith to people. You need to tell them about Jesus Christ. You need to encourage them because they're in bondage. And they're not going to be set free if the gospel is not presented to them. And I was told you have been called by God to do that. Now, I didn't understand exactly what that meant, but I did know that I had friends and I had family who didn't know the Lord. I did know that at one time I was blowing it, I was lost, my life was no good, and, and now I've opened my heart to Christ. I did know that there was a change that was taking place. And that's why I went home, and I didn't go to my parents first. I actually went across the street, and I went to share with the family of the people that I was going to be with that day.
Because as I've told you before, I was supposed to be smoking some pot that day. A friend of mine was receiving a, a kilo of marijuana from, from Thailand. And I was supposed to be going to get loaded that day. And instead, I went to a Christian thing and actually got saved. And so when I came back, instead of going into the house to talk to my mom and dad and, and my sister Madeline, the first thing I did is, is my friends dropped me off. I walked across the street. I went to the house. And I went looking for my friends. And, and they weren't there but their mom was there, and some of the younger sisters and brothers were there. And I, and I walked into the house, and I knew absolutely nothing. I mean, how much can you know in a drive from Hollywood to Norwalk? I mean, how much information can you have? You know, I had no information other than, hey, I gave my heart to Christ. And I went across the street, knocked on the door, and, and Mrs. Nava, the, the mama, opened the door, and I said, hi, can I come in? Is, is, is Gil here? Is Mary Lou here? They said, no, they're not here right now. I said, well, can I share with you something that just happened? And, and she said, yeah. And I said, you know what I just did? I just gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I just became a born-again Christian. And she says, oh, really, that's nice. I said, and I remember talking to her about the Lord. I said, you know, you all need Jesus Christ. Everybody in this house needs Jesus Christ. And now, what do I know other than I was lost and now I'm found? And you know what? You need Jesus. And she says, well, that's sweet of you, honey. Thank you. And I said, that's fine, you know. And you know they got saved? I started bringing the family to church. She went to Calvary Costa Mesa. And Mary Lou, we called her baby doll. Baby doll got saved. And, and, and it was just really cool, you know. And, and then I went home. And then when I went home, I, I, I walked, that's when I walked into the house. And I looked at my dad and I looked at my, my mom and my, my sister Madeline. And they were there in the den looking at the TV set. And, and I came walking in and stood there at the door. And the, all the lights were off. And the only thing you could see was the glow of the TV. And you could see them outlined by it. And I stood there at the door. And that's when I said, Mom, Dad, Madeline, I love you. Praise the Lord. You know, and walked out freaking them completely out. And then I walked out. And that's when Madeline came up and said, What happened to you? What happened to you? And I began to share with her. I said, Madeline, you know how freaky I've been. You know where my life's been? Because my sister Madeline, you know, had seen what I was all about. She knew. I used to talk to her. You know, she saw me the way I was and knew me the way my parents didn't know me. And I said, you know what I've been all about. You know where my life's been. You know how I've been, how crazy I've been. I was absolutely crazy. I would go to parties and there'd be music playing and all these people and I would stand up in the middle of the crowd and start dancing all by myself just to make them laugh. You know, and they'd look at me like, what a freak. And I liked that. I would stand on, the, on, the, on my friend's uh, hood of his 1962 Ford and I'd stand with my, my hands out like, like a, a living hood ornament and drive through the neighborhood, you know, and I would do freaky, crazy things to blow people's mind. I loved doing it. I'd go into the store with a friend of mine, Gloria, and we would make up languages. And we would just make up noise, and we'd talk to each other, and she'd go, and I'd say, yeah. And we'd do that to blow kids' minds, and the kids would just go, wow, you know, these people are from some other country. And we, we just, we did that all the time. We, we did that all the time. I, I had, my parents had a den, and they had a bay window, and, uh, and had drapes that we could close it up with. And we had my dad's uh, easy chair. He had a lazy boy that was a rocker. And I would put Gloria in the rocker, and I would turn her so her back and the chair's back was facing the bay window. And I would wait for people to walk by. And when they'd walk by, I'd have all the lights off, and I would yell out to them. And the sidewalk was only 10 feet away. I would yell out, presenting Gloria Nava. And I'd open up the drapes and turn the lights on, you know, I'd turn the lights on and open the drapes very slowly, then I'd turn her around and she'd wave, you know, like, I mean, we, we had a blast. Crazy, I mean, crazy things, we did silly, weird things constantly. So, that's, none of that's in my notes, I just feel like, <laughs> this is really a better Bible study than that, but um, I just, I got saved. And I came home, and I'm in my right mind. And I haven't been consistently in my right mind for about a year. And so my mom was so used to me being loaded that when I was not loaded, she thought I was loaded. And so, you know, that's why she told my dad, smell his breath, Frank, he's on something. And um, you know what happened? I was taught something that, I have, that I've never stopped doing that I've never stopped doing. I was taught that if Jesus changed your life, tell people about it. 
That's the heart of Calvary Ministries, guys. That's the heart of the Jesus movement. It's just out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. And you can say, you know, once I was lost and now I'm found. Once I was blind, but now I see. You want to know something? The Lord, through his power, has transformed me. And I didn't become religious. I just, I got to know God. I came to realize that God loves me. And, and basically, as we come to know that, we will show forth your praises. Not only will we show forth your praises to our generation, but we will show forth your praises to future generations too. We're going to live consistently for the Lord, and what God has given to us, we will give to our children. And we pray, should the Lord tarry, that our children will love Jesus and give that to their children, you see. And so that's how it works. So he's saying, Lord, he's saying, deliver us, forgive us, avenge us of our enemies who have placed us in this horrible position of bondage. Though we deserve it, we ask that you would forgive us. And as you do, we will give your praise to our generations following. And that's the way it works. And that's what we ought to be doing today. I encourage you, you know, to do that. As, as a, a kid who, who only read comic books, and I, I never read anything other than comic books, you know, and I wasted several years of my life in drugs and alcohol and, 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 and all. After getting saved, starting going to college, and, and I'm, I'm sitting there with these PhDs, and, and, I, and I'm just a dumb, dumb kid with a D minus average in high school. And I'd look at these professors, and I would say, Lord, someone's got to tell them about you. And I would actually wait for somebody else in the class to do it. So, Jesus, may there be somebody here who will do that. Then I finally realized the Lord was saying, there is. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> so you better say something. And I have to tell you, I was nervous. And I have to tell you, I was afraid. I have to tell you that my heart would beat quickly when I would sit there and I'd hear something being said that I just knew there was a better way than that. I can still remember, I'll give you one more illustration as to why that's so real to me. I'm sitting in a class, it's a political science class, the professor says to us, every person is going to have to give, I'm going to give you a word and you're going to have to give to the class five minutes on that word. So be prepared and I will call you and give you the word. And I sat there and sat there uh, day after day, class after class, and I hadn't been called. And then finally one day, he says, uh, Rosales, it's your turn. And I go and stand in front of this class of my peers, and he looks at me, he said, your word is freedom. And so I had a chance to preach the gospel. I said, freedom? And bang, here we go. When you talk to me about freedom, you're talking to me about sin. And you're talking to me about Jesus Christ who sets us free from sin. And this one girl I didn't know was a Christian yells out, hallelujah, you know, and off we went. And, and, and for five minutes, I got a chance to preach the gospel. The professor's sitting there going, hmm, I wish I wouldn't have opened him up to this, you know. Maybe we should have talked about trash, you know. All I know is when you're given the opportunity, shine for Jesus Christ and praise him. You'll blow your mind at the amount of people who are there listening saying, this is fresh, this is new, I haven't heard that before. And that's what we're called to do, guys, just open our mouths and let the Lord fill it with his goodness. Now moving on into Psalm 80, another Psalm of Asaph. This is so that you know the tune, this is set to the lilies, okay, so you all know that, right? Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim. Shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Stir up your strength and come and save us. Restore us, O God. Cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry against the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears, given them tears to drink in great measure. You have made us a strife to our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root and filled the land. The hills were covered with its shadow 
and the mighty cedars with its boughs. She sent out her boughs to the sea and her branches to the river. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? The boar out of the woods uproots it, and the wild beast of the field devours it. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will not turn back from you. Revive us, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. And so in Psalm 80, notice with me again, this is another Psalm of Asaph, and it's a plea. It's a plea, notice with me, to the shepherd of Israel. He's asking the shepherd to once again lead them. Now in verses 1 through 3, we'll combine those, and he says, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. He's pointing out that God is the great shepherd who dwells in the midst of his people. And as the shepherd, he is leading his sheep into safety. And so because the shepherd cares for the sheep and leads them into safety, he's crying out and saying, oh God, my shepherd, deliver me from my enemy. Now, notice with me he speaks of Joseph. He speaks of uh, Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Um, Joseph representing the nation of Israel, the ten northern tribes, and uh, Benjamin representing the two southern tribes, and Ephraim and Manasseh representing all of, really, uh, Israel together with the others is just a picture of God moving amongst the, uh, the nation of Israel. And so he's asking the Lord to work and to restore. Notice verse 3, Restore us, O God, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. In verse 4, he continues and says, O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry against the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in great measure. You have made a strife, a strife to our neighbors and, uh, and our enemies laugh among themselves. He says in verse 7, Restore us, O God of hosts, cause your face to shine. We shall be saved. So he knows that God is angry. He knows that God is angry because God hasn't been answering his prayers. And so he realizes that there's something that has made a separation. See, I'm crying out to you, but there hasn't been an immediate response, and so I'm asking you to, uh, to deal with that, and I realize something is up, and it must be that there is sin in our camp, and that's causing you not to re respond. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 4, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words, speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity." So we have sin that has made a separation is the point he's making. You have been angry. You haven't answered us. As a matter of fact, notice verse 5. He says, you have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in great measure. Instead of taking us into the green pastures, instead of causing us to drink of the still waters, as a shepherd does, we end up mourning over all of this. And not only that, but notice that the enemies here, verse 6, you have made us a strife to our neighbors, our enemies laugh among themselves. The enemies are mocking them. The enemies are mocking them because it seems that their faith in God, the relationship with God is really useless. I was thinking about this today. And I'll, I'll say this briefly, but I observe this even in our day that those who are not friends of God, those who are not friends of the Christian message, those who are not believers, um, they do still mock Christians, especially those who fail. Um, without going into a lot of detail and, and pushing this too far, the fact is, is that if you have somebody do something that is wrong, especially somebody who's well known, and recently, um, you know, we see Jimmy Swaggart making a comment and makes it to the front page and and broad brushes every believer through the comments that he makes. And if you've been reading the news or watching the news, uh, then you'll see that that happens, and it happens regularly. 
Uh, you read in the newspaper concerning a certain individual who's the head of a television um, empire, Christian TV empire, and paying off somebody because the guy is alleging that he had a relationship with him in a homosexual fashion. He pays out of his, his uh, assets $425,000. And if you read the news, it's in the Times. It's, it's there being presented to you. And once again, you have you know, talk show hosts or you have comedians who, who jump on the bandwagon and present these people and say jokes about them. They mock our faith, and that's what happens. And that's what it says here in verse 6 when it says, Our enemies laugh among themselves. It still happens. It still happens today. In spite of the fact that there are so many who love the Lord and are living great lives, in spite of the fact that there are so many ministers who are doing well, it only takes one or two well-known ones to, to cause all the rest of us, uh, you know, to look kind of bad. I've shared this with you before, and perhaps some of you haven't heard this, so allow me to repeat this. Many of you will remember me saying this to you. Many years ago now, uh, Marie and I went out to... Uh, to look at a new van. Our children were young at that time, and we wanted to get a van, and so we went to a particular dealer, and uh, I, was, uh, I saw this van, and I said, I'd like to, like to you know, test drive it, and so Marie climbs in the back seat where she likes to drive, and, and, and I was driving, <laughs> and, uh, and the salesman is seated next to me, and as we're driving, um, you know, he wants to find out whether I have money to pay for this van, so he asks me, uh, what do you do for a living? And I remember as I was driving, whenever anybody asks me that, you never know what they're going to say when you tell them what you do. And I was driving, and he says, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a, I'm a pastor. And it gets quiet. You know, it always gets quiet, so it gets quiet. And he says, oh, pastor, huh? He said, yeah, pastors, uh, a lot of them are thieves. And I thought, that's a pretty good way to sell a vehicle. Um, <laughs> A lot of them are thieves. They steal. And I said, really? I'm driving. Really? Yeah, you know, I just stole out of the poor box to buy this van. No, uh, really? <laughs> and I looked at him, and I said, is that right? He goes, yeah. So I, so I kept driving, and I said, you know, the last three cars that I bought were sold to me by lying car salesmen. I said, but you're not a lying car salesman, are you? He says, no, sir, I'm not. I said, you're an honest car salesman, aren't you? He says, yes, I am. I said, do you know there are 500,000 pastors in the United States, and the overwhelming majority of them love the Lord and serve Him faithfully? Did you know that? He said, no, I hadn't known that. I said, well, that's the truth. I said, you're an honest car salesman, and I'm an honest pastor. It's nice to meet you. You know, I think sometimes people are just looking for opportunity to mock our faith. They, they are. You know, it's unfair pressure on you because you're a human being. I mean, you are going to blow it the way that I, I used to before I became perfect. No, you're going <laughs> to, just like me, you're going to blow it. And, and, and even if you don't, even if you, you, you can even be accused of blowing it when you're not. I was unloading a truck one time. I was working on the dock, and I was unloading a truck, and I had been witnessing to my boss, and uh, I picked up this box. I turned around. I started to walk with it, and I, I didn't see a box in front of me, and it, it started to trip me, and I put my foot on the box, and I slid it out of my way. I shoved it out of my way, and I, as I started to walk past it, my boss happens to walk past the, uh, the, the, uh, the tailgate there, and he looks at me, and he says, Hey, you're a Christian. You're not supposed to get mad and kick boxes around like that. I said, shut up, punk. No, I didn't. <laughs> Get over here. You're not a box. I'll kick you too. <laughs> no, I'm holding this thing and I'm thinking, hey, but I didn't, but I wasn't doing that. It's not that I couldn't, but I just wasn't at that moment. But that's just the way it is, you know. And, and there are people who are looking to make fun of your faith. They're looking to find something wrong with it. They're enemies. And that's what he's talking about. Our enemies laugh among themselves. Verse 7, restore us, O God of hosts, cause your face to shine, we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt, you have cast out the nations and planted it, you prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root and fill the land. The hills were covered with its shadow and the mighty cedars with its boughs. 
She sent out her boughs into the sea and her branches to the river. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? The boar out of the wood uproots it and the wild beast of the field devours it. So he's just reminding uh, the Lord as he writes that, that God brought Israel out of, uh, out of Egyptian bondage and brought them into Canaan or the promised land. And in doing so, he was caring for them even as a vine dresser cares for the vine. At one time, they were prospering, and he points that out. At one point, they were prospering, but now they're unprotected, and now they are abandoned, and he's wondering why that happened. Well, the reason it happened is Israel became a wild vine. Israel was not yielding herself to the Lord. In Isaiah 5, Isaiah wrote and said this, Let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. It shall be burned. Break down its wall. It shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug. There shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that, they, uh, that there rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness but behold, a cry for help. And that's what he's speaking about. What happened? Well, I planted a good vine, and it became wild. So, verse 14, Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. So he cries out that God will once again restore them and have fellowship with his people. He's saying, consider our pain and return to us, Lord. Verse 17, let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the Son of Man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will not turn back from you. Revive us, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. So, when he's speaking about this, there's one who is in a place of power. Notice that in verse 17 when he says, Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the Son of Man whom you have made strong, then we will not turn back from you. So, he's basically speaking of this one who is the Son of Man. It's a prophecy re related to Messiah, Jesus, who restores and who revives. And he's simply saying, When we are revived and we are restored, we will call upon your name and we shall be saved. And finally, Psalm 81. Sing aloud to God our strength. Make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a song and strike the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the lute. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon, at the full moon on our solemn feast day. For this is a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. This he established in Joseph for a testimony when he went throughout the land of Egypt when I heard a language that I did not understand. I removed his shoulder from the, from the burden. His hands were freed from the baskets. You called in trouble. I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I proved you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you will listen to me, there shall be no foreign god among you, nor shall you worship any foreign god. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide. I will fill it. But my people would not heed my voice. Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat, and with honey from the rock I would have satisfied you. Again, this psalm is a song of deliverance, a song of Asaph. It's a song that reminds the people of God how God had delivered them out of bondage in Egypt. Now, as you look at the first few verses, and I'll just, I'll just compress them, 
Notice how he says, sing aloud to God our strength, make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. Speak, this speaks of, of worshiping the Lord, the Lord energetically. It's, it speaks of, of a loud worship to God. And, and without encouraging anybody here to do anything fleshly or carnal, as I read, especially in the Psalms, and we see this often, we'll see it more often as we continue and conclude ultimately in these, in these, uh, in these Psalms, you're going to see that worship is something that, that is described very often as being energetic and vibrant. You know, there are various ways that you worship the Lord, of course. There are times that it's contemplative, almost meditative. There are times that you sing quietly and softly into the Lord in a worshipful sense. And there are other times that you raise your voice to the Lord, you can raise your hands to the Lord, and you worship Him just with all, this, all the energy of your heart. You know, and I think that's a good thing. I think it's a wonderful thing to sing to the Lord with a full voice. I really do. Um, I see people who sing, you know, songs that they like with a full voice, and they're not praise songs. They're just songs that they're listening to on the radio. And sometimes you'll drive by them, and, and they've got their music going, and and today you don't really have to, a lot of the music that, that uh, younger, younger folk are listening to, you don't really need to have to sing. You can talk, you know, you can talk. And you have to look real mad when you do it, too. I've noticed that. You have to look like you're very angry at the world in order to be, you know, and, um, and your ears have to bleed from the bass. And, but you, you see people really getting into it, you know? Well, when we worship the Lord, I really think that, that even as he says in verse 1, sing aloud to the God, to God our strength, to God our strength. Make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, strike the timbre. This is speaking of energetic, energetic worship to the Lord with musical accompaniment, and he's just pointing out that this is how you should do it. The psalmist in Psalm 47, 1, remember what he said? He said, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to, to God with a voice of triumph. And so you sing to the Lord with all of your heart, and that's the point that he's making here. Um, in verse uh, 6, he said, speaking concerning uh, the children of Israel when they were in Egyptian uh, bondage, I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were freed from the baskets. This speaks of slave labor. You called in trouble. I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. So he's speaking concerning the fact that he had released them from the burden of, of slavery. And again, I, I mentioned this to you earlier, uh, but it's so important. Let me say it again. Uh, Jesus Christ came to set the captive free. No matter what program you go through, you can have a five-step program, a 10-step, 12-step program. I understand the philosophy behind those things and all. I took a one-step program, one step to the Lord, one step. You know, and when, when I got saved, again, forgive me if it sounds like I'm just speaking of my own testimony, you know, but that's, that's a, a lot of who I am obviously harkens back to those initial times of, of discovering the things of God. When I got saved, I, I didn't have anybody saying to me, now listen, Dave, you've been drinking for a long time now, and you've been doing drugs for, for a, a good little while, a good portion of your life, so listen, you're going to relapse, and, and so when you do relapse, here's some booklets for you, and we have some recovery groups for you, and because and, and, that's going to happen. I didn't have any of that. Nobody told me that was going to happen. Nobody told me that. Nobody prepared me for that. You know what they told me? They said, you want to know something? Jesus Christ, by His power, sets you free. Did you know that God, the same Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, did you know that He dwells in you now? Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Did you know that? Did you know the Bible says you are the temple of the Spirit of God and, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Do you know that? Man, that's, that's remarkable. Are you kidding me? Yeah, and you want to know something? It's true. And, and the Bible says if any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Do you know that you are brand new in Jesus Christ? That that old David died with Jesus when he was on the cross? You were, he were, you were crucified with him? Did you know that? Paul said that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by, by faith in the Son of God who, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ has died in vain. Did you know that? 
Did you know that you can identify with Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross? Did you know that you can live victoriously and that you don't have to return like a dog returns to the vomit, like a pig returns to the, the mud it was washed from? You don't have to do that. Do you know that now you have power in the Lord Jesus Christ and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? Did you know that? And when you know that, you can change. That's the bottom line. And that's what happened to me. You see, we live today so... I was, I was remarkably transformed because nobody told me it couldn't happen. Nobody told me it couldn't happen. Nobody said, listen, you've been drinking for so long, you're going to stay a drunk the rest of your life. If you get near a, a beer, you get near some wine or whatever, you're going to run right back to it, so stay away from it. I just t tasted the new wine. It's better than the old. And there's no hangovers either, by the way. And, and I don't wake up the next morning wondering what did I do and how did I get here. It's an entirely different thing. I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit of God in you will transform you. And, 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 and you need to know that. You need to know that. Sin is bondage. It's bondage. You know, I, I, I do a lot of ministry. You can imagine, and I've been doing this for 31 years, longer than that, really. I've been teaching 31 years and ministering longer than that. And I'm telling you, from, from what the Word of God says and the experience that I've had, I know that God can transform lives. Have no doubt about it. He does transform lives. It isn't because we became religious. It's because we got to the end of ourselves and said, I, there's nothing in me that's any good. I need help from God. I need help from God. I need help. You know, my, my, I'm breaking my parents' heart. I can't maintain a relationship with a girl because I keep hurting them. And they dump me because I'm a monster. I can't even be kind to people. I can't even be nice to people. I won't even hold the child. I wouldn't even hold my, hold my nephews. I don't want to get near. Leave me alone. That was what I used to say all the time. Just leave me alone. How come you're that way? Listen, if you're worried about me, you know, my mom would say this. My mom wasn't even a Christian, and my sister. And I remember one time my mom said to me, David, I'm praying for you. My mom told me that. I said, keep your prayers to yourself. You need to pray? You feel like praying? Pray for yourself. Just leave me alone. I don't need your prayers. I don't need your God. I don't need anything that you have. So just leave me alone. And that's how I was. You know, you see a man up here who's been transformed. Transformed. Because when I was a kid, man, I don't need you. I don't need anything you can do. I don't care. Just leave me alone. You're in bondage. All I needed was a bottle and some dope. That's all I wanted. Just give me some wine. Give me some beer. I used to take a half gallon of wine and a quart of beer when I was 18. I would mix them together, and that was how I started out my evening, 18. I could outdrink my father when I was 18 years old. I could drink my father under the table at 18. I drank almost a, a half a pint one time. By myself, I didn't even get high. I was 19. I was drinking so much and developing such a tolerance that I had to drink more and more to get a buzz. And you want to know something? When the Lord saved me, there was nobody running around saying, oh, you're going to relapse. Oh, you better get hold of these programs because you know what? You're going to fail. All I was told is I could be more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. I actually believed he forgives me of my sins. I actually believed I could be transformed because he said so. God doesn't lie. That's one thing I knew about God. He doesn't lie. He doesn't lie. And for me, I didn't want to come to the Lord for the longest time because, because well, you don't mess with God. You don't make him mad. You know, you, you leave him alone if you can. Kind of try and hide from him, but, but don't make him mad. You know, so don't ever make a promise you're not going to keep. That's where my head was at. And that's, that's part of the reason why I didn't want to, you know, become a Christian. I was afraid if I become a Christian, what if I fail? And then I discovered, you know, Christ in me is the hope of glory. Him working in me is where it's at. He, he doesn't give me a command without giving me the power to fulfill it. He gives you the ability to do that which is pleasing to him. He does that through his spirit. And God is reminding them, listen, you were in bondage, and you were in a burden, and that's what a sin, 
or uh, that's what sin is. It keeps you in a burden. Psalm 107, 14 through 16 says, He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. He has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Jesus in Luke 4, 18 and 19 said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's why I have come. I have come to set the captive free. And so that's what we see here. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were freed from the basket. You called in trouble. I delivered you. I answered you. In verse 8, Hear, O my people, I will admonish you, O Israel, if you will listen to me. There shall be no foreign God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide. I will fill it. So he's saying, I am the one who provides for you abundantly. No false god ever did or ever could do that. All you need to do is open your mouth and I'll provide for you. I will satisfy your hunger. No false god can do that. You can go into religion all you want. You can pursue meditation. You can pursue anything, a pseudo-Christian cult. You can go into Islam or Buddhism, whatever you want, and you will never have your needs met because only God can do that through His Son, Jesus Christ. He's the one who removes the burden from you. The Bible in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. But he goes on in verse 11, My people would not heed my voice. Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. If you don't want to have a relationship with me, if you don't love me, then I'll leave you alone. One of the things as I was preparing this study that I thought about is that the Lord doesn't force himself on us. He's a gentleman. He woos us, if you will. He, with, with uh, loving kindness, he draws us, but he doesn't push himself on us. Then he goes on and says, Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies, turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock. I would have satisfied you. So he's simply saying, Oh, if you would only turn to me, I'd subdue your enemies, and I would bless your life. I'm not going to abandon you completely, but I want to bless you, and I definitely want to restore you. I will subdue your enemies. In verse 16, when he says, I will have fed them also with the finest of wheat, and I will bless your life. But what you need to do is you need to turn to me. You're not going to get what you're looking for from your false god, from your religion or your human relationship. Only God can forgive sins because it's against God that you have sinned. Only God can forgive that sin. And when God forgives that sin, He restores you to a right relationship with Him. And all He's saying here, and I want you to see this, in verse 13 is that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. That's what I want. That's all I'm asking of you. My great desire is to bless you, to subdue your enemies but you have to come back to me.